Okay, I told y'all I was coming back and here I am, I'm back again. But I wanna tell you a story about how I met the Lord. It was a fantastic story. It's a funny story, but forget all the preamble. Here goes. When I was in my 20s, I had a friend who was maybe 10 years older than me. And she taught me a lot. She taught me how to dress. She taught me about designer clothes, designer cologne. She taught me how to match my things up. And she taught me some bad stuff too. Because we was running scams. We were doing a lot of things that we should not have been doing. And at that time, I um, was doing a lot of drugs. I didn't know Jesus. I was searching had no idea what I was searching for at the time. But this particular day, I had been somewhere that I didn't have no business being. And uh, I had just done some drugs. And after doing the drugs, I heard this voice say, you're going to die. And I'm like, who, who, who is that? I went to lay back down, but I heard it again. And I got up and I hurried up and put my clothes on. And the person I was with was like, what are you doing? I said, I, I, I got to go. I got to go. And they were like, well, don't leave without no money. You, you ain't even got no money. I'm like, I got to go. I remember I ran up. I was um, on Plymouth between Southfield and um, Greenfield. For people in Michigan, they'll know. But people who don't live in Michigan, that's going to just, those are just streets. Anyway. I went to get, back in the day, they didn't call them jitneys. They called them, I mean, they didn't call them Ubers. They were jitneys. You could get a ride and they would take you. Well, I got in the jitney and the man must have knew I was confused and dazed and whatever because he took me in a complete circle, took me up about a mile, over about a mile, and I wound up right down the street from where I was. And I was sitting under a tree in the park and I was like, you know what? I wanna know you, Lord. I wanna know things about you. I wanna understand you. But all I see is you trying to kill people. You you mean, you not, you not loving, you not. They keep telling me you love people, you this, you that. I, I, I. The God I knew then wasn't, wasn't that wasn't him. And let you know, I did not know him. So make a long story short, I went on home. I got home and um, the next day a friend of mine called me and told me she got saved. And you know, old sarcastic me, I was like, saved from what? What you get saved from? And she asked me, could she come over and talk to me? And I'm like, yeah, I guess. It's my same friend. So she came over and I'm trying to tell her about the person that I was cheating on the person that I was living with with. So I'm telling her all about him and I'm telling her about my last rendezvous or whatever. I can't remember exactly word for word what the conversation was. But the one thing I remember was she told me, let me play you something off of my phone. And yes, people had phones back then. Anyway, she played me something off of her phone and what was on her phone threw me for a loop. What was on her phone was the person I was cheating with, flirting with her and trying to get with her and explaining to her how they need to get together and go out. I was devastated because I was under the impression they were crazy about me. They loved me. Well, that's how you get deceived. Anyway, <clears throat> I kept trying to, I, I was going to smoke a joint because at this point I was just flabbergasted. I kept trying to light my joint. I kept trying to light my joint. And she says, maybe God doesn't want you to light it. I'm like, here she go. Ain't nobody asked you all that. So I couldn't light my joint. And she began to tell me her salvation story. And she started telling me about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, coming to church with her. Now, mind you, I was raised Jehovah Witness. And even though I was not a practicing Jehovah Witness at the time, and this is how we be self-righteous. 
even though I wasn't a practicing Jehovah Witness at the time, and even though I had been disfellowshipped from the Jehovah Witness, which in essence is being excommunicated, uh, I still believed in all the tenets. I believed everything. And I also believed that if you went into a church, you would get demon possessed, you know. So part of me wanted to go with her because there was a curiosity there. But part of me was terrified. So I told her, I said, well, if you want me to go to church with you, you better stay here till tomorrow when church, when it, church is supposed to happen. Because if you don't stay, I probably not going. So I laid on the floor in the living room. She laid on the couch and she stayed there all night. Next day, we went to church. And the church we went to was Shalom Temple with Pastor Stacks and, um, <clears throat> mother Estella Boyd was the church mother and um, when I got there we walked in in the middle of testimony service now me having never been in a church in my entire life them people scared the bejesus out of me do you hear me testimony service they up there they just clapping they just clapping they going forth they got the joy of the lord they got the tambourines going i'm looking now mind you being raised a jehovah witness the kind of music i was used to in church or kingdom hall was more of like hymnals more of like classical you know we sing to jesus because we you know is that kind of thing. It wasn't no, uh, we, we, we just get hit, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, what are they doing? So anyway, <clears throat> I'm sitting there and I'm terrified. So my friend is next to me. The ladies are up front with the tambourines and everything. And I had decided, I'm like, I'm about to get up and I'm about to get out of here because they are scaring the crap out of me. Next thing I know, somebody hit me in the back of the head. And she done jumped up and started shouting the lady behind me. So I said, you know what? My friend is on the end of the aisle. I'm going to go past her and I'm leaving. I don't know if she going to leave with me, whatever. I'm leaving. Went to get up. My friend who brought me to church started shouting. I just started crying. I'm like, these people crazy. And I can't do this. So I'm sitting there crying and I'm telling the Lord, if you get me out of here, you ain't never got to worry because I ain't never coming back. You was right. These people crazy. And I ain't never coming back. Anyway, church service was over and, you know, I, I sat through, I wound up sitting through the entire service. And when church service was over, I'm walking out the door and it was the, one of the assistant pastors at the time. You know how they stand at the door and they greet everybody as they're leaving. And he's like, did you enjoy service, baby? I said, no, I did not. I said, I don't know what y'all got. It ain't God and I ain't never coming back. Girl, I, I was back that night anyway. But I get home and I'm going home and I'm going to tell them all about these crazy people at the church. And how they was jumping around, holding their bellies and, you know, I'm like, I ain't never seen nothing like that in my life. I get home and the person I live with tells me, I've seen you dead and you need to give your heart to the Lord. If you don't, you're not going to make it. And that coincided with what I had heard a day or so ago. And they began to explain to me that what those people were doing they had the joy of the Lord and the joy was overflowing. And they began to explain to me about how, um, I, I can't even tell you word for word what they said, but what, what they said convinced me to go back. I'm like, okay, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going back. So I went back that night. When I got there that night, it seemed like I kept looking at my friend like, did you tell this man my business? Did you tell this man my business? Because it was like he was preaching straight to me and everything that he was saying I needed to hear. Well, when he made the altar call, I found myself getting up and I get up and I'm walking to the front. 
but I didn't stand up on my own. I did not get me up. I did not walk me to the front. It just felt like my body just propelled me to the front of the church. Anyway, I get to the front of the church. I'm at the front of the church and I'm standing there. Somebody pushes me from the back, say, thank you, Jesus. Another one pushes me from the front, say, thank you, Jesus. I was like, oh my God, here we go again. I am down here, done came down here. These people are trying to kill me. They full of demons. I should have listened. I shouldn't have came back. All of a sudden, it was like a curtain dropped. Because, well, just before that, I was like, Lord, if you could get me out of here. Oh, please get me out of here. I don't know what prompted me to walk up to the front of this. Before I knew it, when the curtain dropped, it was like I was in this room. And it was nobody in this room but me and him. And... All I saw was a hand reaching out to me and I began to reach for the hand. And as I'm reaching, you remember how old films like in the 30s, 40s, whatever, it would seem like the film was just rolling. I could see all the different seasons in my life and they were rolling past, rolling past. And I just began to push them out the way. I realized all of a sudden both my hands were raised and I was pushing the things out of the way. And as I pushed everything out of the way, nothing was left but that hand. And he just told me to keep my hand in his hand. And it was quite a transforming experience. When everything was said and done, after he got finished having his conversation with me and telling me the things that he wanted me to know, um, when I came back, there was like about three people in the church. Church service was over. Everybody was gone and they pretty much had the lights out. And I got the feeling they were waiting for me to, so that they could leave. Anyway, um, the uh, assistant pastor said, how you feel, baby? I said, I'm blessed and highly favored. And they were like, who said that? But I knew God had done a transformative work. Anyway, the pastor told me not to go home because of the environment I was living in. And he didn't know about the drugs. As a matter of fact, he really didn't know me. But after two weeks, I realized that I had not had any drugs in my body. And I had been a serious substance abuser to where I would get sick if I didn't have something. And at the end of two weeks was when I realized I wasn't getting high anymore and I hadn't even thought about it nor had I had a desire to get high. So it was it was the experience was extremely transformative. But you know how we as people we question things and we wonder and me being from the culture that I was from, I went to my mother and asked her some questions and my mother began to tell me who was a devout Jehovah's Witness, began to explain to me how I had been deceived. So uh, I, I stopped going to church for a while, but church never stopped being inside of me because when he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, he never lied. And through over the years, of being in and out of church, being in and out, falling back, going forward, falling back. There comes a point when you, you get that realization that this thing is real. And if I'm ever going to succeed, I'm going to have to go at it full out. Just like I went at everything else full out. I'm going to have to go at this thing full out. So I'm in a season in my life where I've decided I'm going at it full out. And I am enjoying this season of my life. I am out here in Arizona. It is hot every day. I am, uh, there's a number of things that are happening in my life that are exciting and wonderful and fresh and new. It's like, behold, the fresh and new has come. But I just wanted to share that with you. And I just wanted to let you know that, honey, if God could save me, he could save anybody. Um, not to say that I'm a horrible person, but I've had my moments. All I can say is sin doesn't owe me anything. You know, I'm, I'm, but I'm better off here. I've lived, I'm, well, I'm not going to tell you my age, but I've lived a life 
And what I can say from having lived a life, if you've never experienced nothing, you don't have anything to share with anybody. If you've never gone through anything and a person goes, well, have you ever done drugs? And you say, no, well, how you know how I feel? But if you have a frame of reference, you have a frame to where you, it's like you're a kindred spirit and you can speak on what I've been through because you've gone through it. It's like somebody who would say, if you've never lost a child, don't tell me you know how I feel because you don't, because you've never experienced what I've experienced. So it's kind of like that. But I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I will be seeing you guys again. You know, I told you I got a lot of stuff to share with you. I got a lot of stuff to say. And I will be back. It'll be happening again. So just hold on. We're going on this ride together. You want to go on a journey? Let's get to know the Lord. How about that? Okay, I'll see you again.